Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm giving a report on filling the gaps and needs of NRENs from the Silk experience. The virtual Silk Highway project, as it was called, is a major component of the NATO Science for Peace and Security program. It has provided internet connectivity and infrastructure support for the national research and education networks along the Silk Road in the Caucasus and Central Asia between 2002 and 2010, and continues with Silk Afghanistan in the range 2010 to 2015. These are the nine Silk countries, Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. And you see from the map that they're quite different in size, and you can also expect them to be quite different in their uh, capacity for raising funds for education and research. But it also should be noted that except for Afghanistan, they were, of course, all members of the Soviet Union, and so they had a common educational background. Before Silk, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the demand for communication between CIS scientists and the outside world increased dramatically. COCOM, which was the export limitation, limited modems to 1,200 board. Fiber was non-existent. Russian satellites were available. DESI, my home institute in high energy physics in Hamburg, stepped in for the high energy physics community with funding by INTAS in Brussels, linking the high energy physics institutes across the CIS at 128 kilobit per second rates to HEPnet. We had a special network for high energy physics at the time in CERN. Towards SUC. Since the mid-1990s, the NATO science program had been providing networking infrastructure grants, NIGs, both for hardware and for communication links to individual institutes to the NATO partner countries, which were at that time the former members of the Warsaw Pact, but the NATO partner country list has been extended quite a bit, and we'll come back to that later. After all these individual links, there was a discussion and a wholesale unified approach was agreed by the NATO networking panel covering the whole area with one high power satellite under a multi-year contract geared to annual NATO budgets. This was the satellite footprint, and you can see it goes nicely from the Black Sea into Kazakhstan and covers the whole area quite well. When you read the small print at the lower right, you'll also notice that it was a Turksat 2A, and this Turkish satellite proved to be very effective, having a cross-connected transponder to make connection between Europe and this area. This is the view to the other side. Evidently, the Turkish satellite was designed in such a way to supply television programs to the Turkish population in Western Europe. So we piggybacked very nicely on this existing satellite for the communication to Central Asia. In Silk One, we had to start with little money, even though a dollar at that time was worth quite a bit that it is now. Uh, the first three years, we could only afford 20 megabits per second of shared bandwidth. With co-funding, we reached 30 megabits per second later. Now, this 20 or 30 megabits is, of course, divided between nine countries. But as you will remember from this morning presentations on the Tunisian network in the 90s, uh, these were the kind of numbers you had in the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, if you carefully 
uh, watched out who was doing what with the traffic, you could support quite a bit of research and education over this bandwidth. Silk connected NRANs, not single institutes. This was different from what there was before. Of course, it required that NRANs had to come into existence where they did not exist. So NRANs had to have a proper acceptable use policy to be connected, which also means that they had to have their internal organization in order, in order to be eligible. They had to agree internally on the bandwidth sharing inside the country. And there is, of course, a technical advantage to satellite broadcasting. It enables sharing of otherwise unused bandwidth across the NRENs, between the NRENs, and across three time zones, since you don't have the same business hours in the different time zones this helps you to make better use of the scarce capacity. Specific gaps and needs were covered with networking infrastructure grants, which were typically in the order of 200K over two years. There were a lot of last mile issues and other problems that had to be covered in the countries concerned. The infrastructure for the last mile of meant there was no telephone wire going to the uh, connecting institutes, so the only way was to use radio modems. Nice, very nicely, in the early 2000s, the spread spectrum modems that we know now for Wi-Fi became into existence and could be used to cover all these open pieces. This is a view of the antenna at DAISY, so we had all of Central Asia on one dish. It was a 5.6 meter dish, and the satellite operated in K air band, which is a technical uh, note to take. K A was a very scarcely used capacity on satellites because the equipment was rare to use it. This is why the prices were very attractive to use this KA band satellite capacity. We had to run silk. The only thing we contracted was satellite capacity. Then we, of course, had stations set up, but a computer network needs a people network to run it. The hub crew and eight of the nine points of presence spoke Russian as well as English, so they could solve the end-to-end -end issues. Regular telephone and video conferences, plus two to three rotating face-to-face -face board meetings annually were crucial, with participation of both the administrative and technical experts, especially in the cases of bleeding-edge technology use. People try to get very smart in using the scarce capacity, and sometimes they get too smart. So the end users will not be happy with it, and it's important that you have them all around the table when you sort these things out. The necessary equipment for the telephone and video conferences was provided by NATO grants, NICS, including batteries, generators, and diesel fuel, because there were quite a few logistic problems in the Caucasus and other places where unless you had your own diesel, you had no connectivity. Complementary EU projects helped out here greatly when NATO could not provide personnel support. Thank you, EU. Here you have a nice picture, some of the faces, we'll see more faces later. Uh, this shows the Silk Board meeting number 20, which was the final meeting. It was held in Brussels, of course, and you can guess that the location is NATO. Uh, but it should be noted that with 20 meetings, we managed to go around the different nations twice and have been to all the places. 
So two came next. A technology neutral trender produced only satellite offers. This was a lesson learned. You can ask for fiber, but you don't get it because a satellite offer can be made easily covering multiple countries. A fiber offer, as Dante will know, is something which has to be done on a very individual basis and the neighbor does not necessarily want to be part of the deal. The continuation with new satellites had their teething problems. Silk so one was done according to the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Whereas this tender produced an SLA, which even though the SLA was fulfilled, did not meet the, the requirements of the people. It started on satellite, but fiber grew from the Pacific and the European end into the former Soviet Union. So where it became available, we could go for fiber. And the total bandwidth was something in the order of 100 megabits per second. The transfer of the NRENs to EU-funded regional networks like the Central Asian Research and Education Network, CARIN, was a typical outcome of Silk 2. And here you see faces which you probably can recognize which was the kickoff meeting of Karen, the Karen launch in 2010. Silk Afghanistan was part of Silk and it continued after the other networks were integrated into Karen and into initiatives around the Black Sea. Continued first with multiple satellite points of presence in in Afghanistan. Then, when it became available, there was additional bandwidth to Kabul on fiber. And what was started, and which is the difference to the other NRENs that we had in Silk, is that Afghanistan had no NREN. So it was an important part of the development of the AFG REN under the auspices of the Afghan Ministry of Higher Education covering the provinces. I think what is now in the plans is 31 locations around Afghanistan. And Prepper prepared things for Silk AFG 2.0. This is what we have today and which will cover 2014 to 15 so far. And there were big steps forward. There's an STM1 connection of AFG REN from Kabul to Xi'an in Vienna, which means that in a certain way, AFG REN has graduated into a real NREN. There's the use of domestic fiber because there's quite a bit of domestic fiber now uh, done by Chinese Chinese work in Afghanistan. Six of these fibers are active, nine more are planned and are being laid. And other sites are connected by wireless. It was clear that a number of places could only be covered by satellite. We made a tender and it turned out there was an interesting alternative to satellite. Afghanistan is a country which has a lot of mobile phones because of the infrastructure which is not there and what you need for mobile phones is mobile phone towers and between mobile phone towers you have microwave. So it turned out that the offer was better for the mobile phone towers and so five sites are connected by wireless with 11 more planned. The mobile phones have another role because the domestic fiber and a domestic fiber is funded by the Afghan government and there is a tax on mobile phone companies which provides input 
for connections to the provinces and that what finances the domestic fiber, whereas the outside connection both to Gion and the wireless, which has its own outside connection, is funded by NATO until 15. Here you have see yesterday's traffic. You see at the top the way to Gion, and you see clearly that there is not much traffic at night, that things are concentrated in the business hours, and you see different places, and only the last place is really different, which is Jalalabad, evidently has quite a bit of activity at night, we don't know why, but it's probably a case of people having access to the outside world and since the place has power, because there is a strict correlation in many places with diesel fuel and internet access. Many places shut down their connections at lunchtime because people should eat and not look at the internet, so you can save two hours of diesel fuel. The wireless traffic is similar, and the third line from the top you see, which has a lunch break, you see that they have to shut down in Bamiyan during lunch because they don't have enough diesel. Conclusion. For more than a decade, the NATO Virtual Silk Highway project has used available funds and available technology to maximum effect. The firms dealing with NATO, of course, were, had a learning phase when they found out that dealing with the scientific end of NATO had a totally different pricing scheme from dealing with the military end. To fill the gaps and needs of the NRENs in Central Asia, enabling them in turn to provide their stakeholders with access to the internet for education, including schools. There was a big school project in Georgia and in other places. With audio and video conferencing support, you will not get any better service than you get when you have to use the tools that you're giving your customers yourself. If you have to use audio and video to run your network, it'll be working every day. And scientific projects from earthquake detection to telemedicine, you can fill in the whole list of things there, astronomy, what you find. With a silk background, let us look at the gaps and needs of ASREN and possible NATO grants. This is the web page of NATO for NATO science. Grant applications require two co-directors, one from a NATO partner and one from a NATO country. If you have multiple countries, of course, you have more directors. You have to pass a peer review. You have to get approval for, by 28 NATO countries, which is sometimes simple and sometimes not so simple. Grant-giving organizations like regional and co-funded proposals. So this is the part of application engineering. These are the 41 NATO partners, and I counted 11 in Arabia, and they go to the United Arab Emirates in the east and start with Mauritania in the west. And uh, as I learned that there are 22 countries in the Arab League, this is half of the Arab League, which is covered with these 11. These are the 28 NATO countries. This is where you have to look for your colleagues for applications to pair a co-director from the partners and a co-director from the NATO countries. And you find me at this email address. And do you have questions? Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think that